Hi, I'm Robert and, uh, from Google Santa Monica. Um, I'm very proud to uh, introduce Mark Burgess of CF Engine fame um, and uh, Oslo University. He is going to be speaking to us today uh, about uh, CF Engine and the promise of configuration management, CF Engine 3 in particular, and uh, some neat new things it involves. Um, if you have questions at the end, uh, please uh, use the, uh, uh, the, the Dory page, which is at go slash CF Engine dash talk. And uh, if you're local, we can ask them local. If you're remote, please do it that way. And uh, we'll ask them for you. Um, and now, without further ado, Mark Burgess. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Or good day to people at various places of the planet. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk to, uh, to Google about my work. Uh, for some time now, I've been studying the problem of configuration management. And um, some years ago, maybe five years ago, I decided it was time to stop coding arbitrary solutions and to try to think a little bit clearly about the theory of the subject, which hasn't been really very well developed, I think. And so I spent the past five years somehow developing some ideas about this. And after five years now, I'm in the situation where I want to stop thinking about it and actually re-implement some of these ideas. And this is where CF Engine 3 comes in. But we'll get along to that as time goes by. Management. Imagine your reaction. If a manager, leader, or even government, for that matter, said, I'm going to look after you. No, no, I insist. Um, but here's the deal. You have to take off all your clothes, all your protection, all of your personal protection, all identifying marks. You have to be completely faceless, identical, and you have to allow me to basically do whatever I, you have to do basically whatever I say. If somebody said this to you as a human being, you would probably be rightfully suspicious of their intentions. And yet, this is exactly the model, the principal model that people use for IT management today. Centralized, push-based, rollout systems, steamrollering applications to machines, pre-specified, push it out, nobody gets to question. Now, I have all kinds of things that I could say about this, this point of view. And I'm not known for not being outspoken, so I'm going to try to uh, be a little bit outspoken today when I'm talking about this. But the bottom line is that I want to argue that this kind of thinking is not just maybe a little old-fashioned or that somehow the philosophy is undesirable, although it can also be discussed on those merits. But I want to argue that this is, in fact, a poor form of engineering, that there is, in fact, a better way of engineering systems, a more reliable and a more specific way of engineering systems that we can use to solve this problem. So if you like, I want to explain my solution to getting 300 people to take their clothes off, or if you like, getting IT systems to behave. And my story takes me back to 1992 when I started Actually, uh, it, when I, just after I came to Oslo, I started working at the university. And like a lot of people, uh, got involved in managing some workstations. In this case, a small handful of Sun workstations. And it didn't take very long to realize that we needed the help of the university. The university had their centralized management system. They helped us with their rollout. They pushed out all of their programs onto our servers and we discovered that we actually had special needs. And anyone that works in a sort of research type of company or a university for that matter knows that special needs are not as uncommon as you would like to think. And this very nice idea of somehow being able to replicate hundreds of thousands of machines all identical is not such a useful thing when it comes to managing actually people's workstations. So, um, no matter how much we want to believe in this idea of control, it turns out that it's not such a great idea. And I would say that all we can really hope for is not rollout systems uh, making a big impression on hundreds of thousands of machines, but the best we can hope for is to 
have some expectation of the behavior that the system is going to produce to somehow be able to ask for a particular specification and hope that the machine will behave in the way that we expect. Now, there are all kinds of reasons why simply rolling out images and pushing these things out would not work. And I think it's interesting, I, this picture of course is a picture of horses and I wanted horses because it turns out that this term management comes from horsemanship. If we trace it back, the etymology of management comes from horsemanship. And Anyone that's tried to ride a horse knows that you can't simply control these things. They have minds of their own. They tend to respond in unpredictable ways and maybe whispering in their ears and some sugar cubes, we can get them to do what they want. But in fact, it's not just a problem with horses. IT systems also behave in unpredictable ways. Not because they have minds of their own necessarily, but because they have owners who have minds of their own and have perhaps different ideas as to how central rollout systems should work. Uh, also that the environment itself is so complicated these days that we cannot imagine modeling absolutely everything in the environment and expecting systems to work in exactly the way we predict when we develop these ideas in captivity and then try to roll them out into the wild. So, I'm not going to recommend you whisper into the USB port or stick sugar, sugar cubes into the power supply. But there have to be better ways of getting computers to cooperate, allowing us to expect cooperation from computers than, than by push-based management. And I have a story for anyone who's a non-believer, which is I thought was quite interesting. This is from a couple of years ago at a conference when somebody was arguing with me about this, saying, Mark, this idea about voluntary cooperation, it's very nice, but I don't believe a word of it. At our company, we simply cannot live with the uncertainty of not knowing exactly what's going to be on our machines. We can't be having all of this voluntary cooperation nonsense. We have to know. And then he wanted to show me something on his PC, and he couldn't because there was some software installed, some security software. But he said, oh, no problem. I know how to get around this. And then in the same sentence, he'd somehow proved the point that push-based management systems are not in control of systems. The end user with physical access can always override it. And therefore, basically what we have is voluntary cooperation by the owners of the machines, by the software running on the machines, or however we want to, to phrase it, the local machine has the ability to override any kind of central management system. So we should be able to expect that and model for it. All right. So. What I want to talk about is, is the work that I've done on modeling this. And my idea is that the way we should try to uh, address this question is to, to look at those individual devices, to look at the smallest parts in the system that can change, and start the modeling from the bottom up instead of from the top down. And in that way, understand how to put together components into larger systems in predictable ways rather than trying to force properties onto collections of components that we will assume behave in a particular way. Now I start this um, with a slide which I like very much. Uh, a couple of years ago I, I found a book by the author Alvin Toffler. Alvin Toffler was a, a writer and futurist. At the end of the 1960s he wrote this wonderful book called Future Shock, which I was lucky enough to find a copy of um, on the internet, and he's really coming out of the, the end of the 60s when in America, of course, people were very frightened of communism, uh, frightened of this idea of the industrial society, that mass production would mean that everything in the future would be mass produced, and that mass production meant that everything would therefore be the same, that you would have no variations. Everybody would, would be wearing the same suits, the same clothes, the same hairstyles, because all we could do would be to mass produce. And Toffler said, no, this is nonsense. The point of technology is to be able to manage these variations cheaply. If, if humans had to implement these things and mass produce them, maybe it would be better to mass produce. But if you have a, a decent technology, any half decent technology, should be able to mass produce lots of variations as well, just as cheaply. And I think this, is a, a, this was a key point for me, 
in creating CF Engine, which was precisely to overcome this need for variability at the university. Instead of having the centralized management, we had all these special needs people, and suddenly we'd have a system to be able to tackle these special needs. There's another problem with push-based management. And this comes from research into policy-based management systems. I don't know if you know about policy-based management, but it's been around for 10, 15 years, about the same time as uh, CF Engine started. Uh, the idea of policy-based management started. And there's this idea of an obligation policy that you can oblige a machine to behave in a particular way. And here's my explanation as to why that doesn't work. Imagine the child of British and American parents. The mother says, you have to say tom tomato. The father says, you have to say tomato. And this poor child is, has these obliging orders from, from outside and cannot resolve the issue either way, cannot make a choice which will resolve the conflict because the information isn't local. Flip it around and look at it in terms of voluntary cooperation. And then you say that you ask the child to promise. Instead of believing on obligations, you make the child promise what he's going to do. And of course, the child can promise to say both tomato and tomato. No problem. If it's, he can promise to say tomato to the mother, tomato to the father, no conflict. He can promise to say tomato at certain times of day, tomato at other times of day, no conflict. And the only thing that would be a conflict is, is promising to say the same thing in two different ways at the same time, which is easily resolved because now the child is in control of his destiny. He has the ability to, to make the change locally. And this is why I believe the idea of a promise is more useful than the idea of an obligation. I'll mention this again in, in just a minute. But. So, Essentially, the idea of an external obligation doesn't increase our certainty about what the outcome of this is going to be. And what we're trying to do in management is get some kind of idea of what we, being able to predict the outcomes of things. We're interested in outcomes. And with obligations, conflicts are rife. Obligations can be coming from all kinds of different sources and they're impossible to resolve. So somehow obligations increase uncertainty. They don't reduce the amount of uncertainty. And in a, diverse, a situation of diversity, I think this is important because there are many different sources of ideas, uh, many different sources of the specifications, the requirements people need for having their IT systems. And if we're going to be able to support all these variations, we're going to have these sources and we need to be able to resolve them. So simply steamrolling people into conformance isn't the answer, but we need to be able to go down to the individual components, see what properties they need to have and get them to make the promises about how they're going to behave and adapt ourselves to that scenario instead of trying to force things on them from the outside. And this is not just a philosophy, it's an, an engineering principle more than that. All right, so promises, it's a model. And I want to tell you about what I think of as the idea of, of a promise because when I use the term promise, I use it in a special way, perhaps a slightly limited meaning but in a way that I can formalize and use in a technical sense. But, okay, I'm going to try to, in this story, I need you just to suspend your disbelief just a little bit, and I'm going to ask you to suspend your disbelief perhaps more than usual. So let's start with the, the common everyday idea of a promise and see how we get to promises that technology can make. So promises from everyday life, I promise to walk your dog, I promise that I did feed your cat while you were away. Promises don't have to be about the future. They can be about facts. Then things from IT, um, help desks, for example. The staff of our company promise to respond to your queries within 24 hours. This is a promise. Then we can abstract this a little bit and say the help desk promises to respond to your requests in 24 hours. And notice now that we've transferred the promise from human beings that are typically assumed to make promises to an abstract piece of furniture. And this is not such a big problem. It's just an abstraction. 
Now we can say the computer promises to respond in 24 hours or in five milliseconds or whatever the service level agreement is. So we can make agreements or, or promises about the kind of service levels for technology. We can promise that a firewall will let through certain packets from certain addresses. And this doesn't seem too bad. Finally, we can say things right down to the software level, that the software component promises to have certain characteristics, certain, certain properties. It will behave in a certain way. So this idea of a promise is really a declaration of intent on the part of some object in a system. And normally we assume that the decision maker has to have some kind of free will, but by association, clearly we can make, we can talk about the promises being made by bits of technology. And what I think is important about promises is that their function is to reduce our uncertainty about the situation. Whether they're about past, present, or future, the function of a promise is to help us to judge the situation and give us confidence, more trust, if you like, that the situation will work out in a way that we can predict, which is kind of what we want to do in management. Now, often people say to me, well, you know, I'm not quite buying this idea that technology can make promises. Um, but an electrical engineer probably wouldn't blink twice at the idea that this resistor is a tiny little inanimate object, a bit of carbon or something, which, which has these stripes on it, which, is, which are making a promise that it has, you know, it will resist, I will resist you with uh, a resistance of 100 ohms plus or minus 5%. This is a promise, clear promise. And we don't worry about where this thought came from. It's simply a property of the component. So we can use promises as declaration of the properties of the components we want to put together from the bottom up in a system and use it just like electronic engineers do to create something with predictable properties also and know that it will work in that, in that framework. So the other thing about promises is that promises document intentions. And intentions are what we want really to know about in management. We want to know what will be the outcome. Not necessarily all of the details that went into making this happen. Um, for example, if I give you a recipe to make something, then maybe my recipe is not a very good recipe. Maybe it can be improved upon. Maybe you don't want to know all of the details and maybe they simply cloud the issue. What you really want to know is what comes out the other end and whether or not it has usable properties. We can do this with promises alone. The promises will therefore hide those procedural details that we don't need to know. So, one of the things that, if you like, uh, I started looking at even years ago in connection with CF Engine was the idea of using declarations of final state, declarations of the outcome, instead of descriptions of the process. In other words, intentions and not algorithms. And I think this is an important step in making management understandable, as I'll explain in just a bit. So this is not just a philosophy. I'm not saying that it's, you know, it's not fair to people to, to push out ideas onto them. It's not fair to technology to oblige systems, whatever. This is really an engineering principle. Just as electronics engineers build things up from the bottom up with components, so we should do the same with IT systems. And here's the principle that works like this. We divide the system up into its basic components, the smallest parts that can change independently. In other words, the smallest parts that can make an independent promise. And this gives us many, many promises. We document all of the promises that we have to make in order for these things to actually fit together into a working system. Not just their individual properties now, but when I put them together and I want the whole thing to work and have a function which is the sum of its parts, or greater than the sum of its parts, then I want to know how, what kind of promises was, will result when I put together these individual components. The final detail is that, and this is where the discipline, the engineering discipline comes in, is that agents may only make promises about their own behavior. I cannot promise things about other people, 
This computer here can't promise anything about the behavior of another computer on the internet. They have no connection to each other. Only autonomous entities, individual components locally can say anything about or can have any expectation of how their behavior will be and therefore the only promises they can realistically make are about themselves. And this is, this is the essence of the, the principle. So, is this about declarative versus procedural? Declarative languages, imperative languages. This is a discussion that comes up again and again at conferences, often in connection with tools for configuration management. And the discussion rages. Well, here are two examples. Here's, a de here's a, an imperative programming language at the top and a declarative language at the bottom. And I think you can see that they're both as chaotic and messy as each other. So it's not about readability. I find Chinese to be quite unreadable, but somehow strangely beautiful, but definitely unreadable. But millions of Chinese have no problem, so maybe the problem is with me. Well, it, the same thing with declarative languages. It's not the fact that they're declarative or imperative that's the problem. It's whether or not they describe their intentions clearly. And if you pack these things full of detail that's not relevant, if you pack them full of procedures that may or may not be optimum, may or not be correct, suitable, whatever, then you're hiding the intentions, and this is a problem. So in favor of promises is hide, hide these procedural details, hide the imperative details, and simply talk about the intentions. Now, the controller paradigm could also do this, of course. It could talk about, you know, I want you to do precisely this. I don't care how you do it, but I want you to do this. But this, uh, this controller paradigm, the obligation paradigm that's dominated thinking, has these other problems of resolving conflicts. So it doesn't reduce the uncertainty. It might reduce the level of clarity, sorry, it might improve the level of clarity somehow, but it still has this problem of distributed constraints being not resolvable. Similarly, the imperative paradigm in computer programming, the idea that we write sequences of commands and follow the sequences to their logical conclusion, which has dominated programming for a long time, um, is very difficult to escape from, but somehow if we want to move beyond this uh, into a situation of reliability, then we need to be able to escape this. The concept of voluntary cooperation is a useful model because it allows us to think hard about systems work. It figures, allows us to, gives us a discipline for putting the components together in using the promises that we know about them and being able to understand the behavior that they're going to have based on these promises. And that will allow us to focus on what is fixed, what's invariant about these things, not details that may change, implementation details, but about the actual properties which are somehow invariant more stable over time. So here's a, a simple example which I often use of how to understand the DNS system in terms of promises. And probably, I find this example interesting because it shows a whole level of complexity which we often assume isn't, isn't in DNS. DNS, the simplest of systems, how could it be, how hard could it be? And yet when we start documenting the individual components, there are many of them. There is a program which wants to look up an IP address. There is an intermediate agent, the resolver, which actually will make connections to various servers. The servers make various promises to listen for requests, of course, and to reply if they receive requests. Actually, it's not enough that the client simply sends a request. This is some kind of an obligation. The server actually has to promise to listen to it. And what that means is that it has to have a port that's listening. It has to have uh, an open port, i.e. the no firewall blocking connections and so on. So this, this, ask, this leads to questions about what are the conditions required to make this service work? And if these properties, if these promises are not kept, the system won't work. If we can then identify the sources of these promises, maybe it's the server daemon, maybe it's a configuration file, might be all kinds of different things then we can, in fact, trace the, uh, the causal 
connections between the system and see how it actually works. This gives us a discipline. Starting with some system, we, want, we know how we want it to work. We figure out the promises that have to be kept in order for that to happen, assuming that each part can only promise things about its own behavior. And this gives often surprising results that helps us to debug systems. We can talk about this uh, another time. This, I could fill a whole separate lecture with this uh, example. So to move on a little bit, how would this take us forward? So far, I've told you how to basically reproduce what we already know, to analyze systems that we already have, possibly understand them in new ways. But how could we go beyond this and actually use it as a design principle for building new systems from the bottom up? The first thought that you have is that these things form patterns. And as we separate the system into these individually changing components, and the promises they make, they form certain structures. These structures, patterns, can be copied, reproduced. If we have a certain bunch of things that make certain promises that give certain results, then probably the same bunch of things and promises would have the same set of results somewhere else. So we can take this as a new component. And what we get is a kind of molecular chemistry. This is the atomic view of computer science. Each agent with its promises is now like an atom. Each promise that it makes gives it a property. So in chemistry you have, you know, will it bond to this or will it bond to that kind of element. In IT we have, will the DNS server bond to its client because it has some op listening open port? Is there a binding between them? Will these things operate together? What kinds of new systems can I make by binding DNS to a web server, to a database, for example? And we come up with these generic patterns which can be reused. So these promises give us a way of talking about the chemistry of systems, if you like, uh, the way of building reusable components, mo molecules, if you like, of, of computer systems, and therefore being able to reuse the concepts. So this is about promises. And this is somehow the model that I spent these past five years. Maybe you think this is something that could be done in five minutes. It took me five years. Um, well, maybe I'm slow. Uh, but it took a long time to figure out the simple stuff, you know, finding the simplicity in it. And this allows us to describe systems. So now what we want to do is to try to take this and apply it to the, to the idea of infrastructure management. And I've given you a clue already from the last slide about how that might possibly be done. But let's go back to CF Engine for a moment now because this is how I started the whole thing. What we really want to do is to manage infrastructure. An analogy that I often use is this of gardening. I used to do gardening when I was uh, coming out of high school. And uh, there are a lot of similarities between gardening and IT. You need to trim the weeds every now and again, clear up the junk. You need to, uh, if you want to, make nice patterns, you can do that. If you want to let it grow more organically, you can do that. All kinds of special needs, everybody, each taste to their own. And we're not trying to push an idea of taste onto somebody. We want to allow people to express themselves artistically and you know, promises will give them the self-expression they need. Well, patterns have many characteristics. So here we have a very regular pattern. Here we have something more organic. This is a discrete pattern. This is a continuous pattern, changing uh, performance pattern of, of a computer. And then, of course, we have patterns of physical devices, physical hardware, networks themselves. All these things form patterns from the software level to the configuration file level, process level, to the network, the physical level. All of these things form patterns. So what we need to be able to do to manage IT infrastructure is to be able to manage patterns. Well, we can do that with promises. Here's a pattern. And I've written by the side of it some pseudocode, which is actually inspired by CF Engine 3. You could actually write this in CF Engine 3 to generate this pattern. And what this pseudocode does is it compresses the structure in this pattern into a few simple rules. We know that every time we have patterns, we can turn them into rules. Games of chess, we have certain rules. Um, 
certain kinds of paintings, certain kinds of rules. Well, this is a particular kind of structure with certain properties. We have certain kinds of rules for building it. So we can turn components with promises in between them into components binding together, making patterns. And this will allow us to build IT infrastructure. That's the idea. And then comes the, the crunch, which is this unspoken hypothesis which underlies all of configuration management, actually, which I have to say is not proven. And that is that all behavior that comes out of a computer system is basically associated with some kind of configuration. That what we manage is the configuration. What we want to get out of it is the behavior. And the idea is that if we configure the computer right, it will behave as we want it to. Now, this is not simple. It's not obvious. It's not even necessarily true. It's easy to find counterexamples where we, we set up a system, seems to be perfect, put it into a bad situation, and it simply cannot perform the function that we configure it to do. If we pull out the plug, obviously, it's not going to happen. So this, this is clearly has its limitations. But if we assume some kind of general level of uh, uh, predictability, stability, then it's not a re an unreasonable assumption that in a, a fairly predictable world, we configure something, it changes the behavior. And by, we can somehow control or turn the knobs to make the system behave as we want. We do this by restricting at least in CF Engine, we do this by restricting to certain kinds of promises, promises that have particularly predictable behavior. And this turns out to be related to the idea of a potential. You know, in artificial intelligence, there's this idea of uh, finding the optimum by creating a potential well. So a ball would roll to the bottom of, uh, of the well or the bottom of a valley, and this would be the stable result of the decision. And by making these potentials, we can solve problems by somehow finding the minimum of this, uh, this valley. This is an idea I'll come back to in a second. Repeatability. We want to maintain systems. We want them to be uh, updated and watched over and maintained over time. So I choose to paint my fence green. In a couple of years, I may cho choose to paint it red, but I can't just assume that it will stay green for the two years in between. Sun, wind, and rain are changing. Uh, bleaching the colors, animals are leaving their deposits on, on it, and so on. It is, has to be maintained. The color has to be update, updated. The original intention has to be continuously maintained. So we need to be able to repeat these promises. And promises imply somehow that if I make a promise, I'm going to keep this promise over time also, not just I'm going to keep this promise for five seconds, but it's going to last for a certain amount of time. So the idea of a promise also somehow embodies this idea of maintainability. Now, in CF Engine, I have this uh, picture that I use quite a lot to describe the way that CF Engine makes decisions as opposed to uh, other scripting approaches. This is the imperative approach. This is the CF Engine approach. In, if we're trying to build a system in the traditional way, we would it's somewhat like climbing a mountain, climbing up a hill, hill climbing. We do one thing, we stop, we do the next thing, we make a turn, we do the next part, and each part, new part, builds on the last thing that we did. So it's a sequence of changes forming a path. The trouble with this is that it's, uh, it's easy to interrupt the path. If you put an obstacle in the way, if one of, the, one of these steps fails to complete, then the path is broken, and there's no obvious way of resolving it. This is the potential approach that I mentioned, the, the uh, artificial intelligence approach, if you like, or the decision potential approach, the CF engine way, and also somehow the promise way of doing it. We, we turn the mountain upside down and say, instead of getting to the top of a mountain, we want to get to the bottom of a valley. And we arrange for the system to, be, to behave in such a way that it will always roll into this point. No matter what change we make, it will always get back to this predictable point, the golf ball hole or the black hole, whatever we want to call it. And this is the key to having maintainability. So at the bottom of this is green fence. And if any kind of change pushes us away from green fence, 
then it will roll back. The automation system, the maintenance system will push you back to this state that you want to be in, which is this spick and span green fence. You have a question? So the question is, can you have localized minima, which is a problem when you're trying to optimize these kind of landscapes? Yes, you can, but there's another, another the next part, which is the way to avoid that. Um, the other part of the, the decision-making potential here is that each one of these holes, these black holes, should represent an independent aspect of the configuration itself. What does that mean? Well, let's say you're managing files you know that you can manage the permissions on files independently from the contents of the file. The owner of the file can be maintained independently to the permissions and the contents. These are three orthogonal uh, changes that can be made. If we always make our policy in terms of these orthogonal directions, then there is never going to be an impediment. There's only going to be a single global minimum in each individual thing. And the only problem we're going to have is if we start making things dependent upon each other. So avoiding dependencies between the promises is the second part. Again, sort of making the, not just the agents autonomous, but the promises themselves non-overlapping and autonomous. And it turns out that this is optimal in a different way as well. What we do is we create a new language a new alphabet of commands, if you like, for coding these promises about systems. These alphabet, this alphabet, this language, is a bunch of symbols which basically represent promises. So promises to set file permissions, promises to set contents, promises to set ownership, promises to start processes, promises to uh, configure interfaces. There are many possible promises. They don't overlap, they don't interfere, but they can all be couched in this way of a global potential. Now, when you do this, you find that you need only a single promise to represent the entire process. One symbol for the whole thing, which is somehow an optimal coding. Because in any program to correctly configure a machine, you need each symbol once and only once which if you know about information theory, my friend Shannon here, Claude Shannon, told us is a maximum entropy distribution. It's the highest amount of uh, compression that you can achieve in a language coding. In other words, each symbol or each promise contains the maximum amount of information for its representation. Or somehow we've put the maximum amount of meaning into every bit of symbol, every symbol in our language which sounds kind of good, but uh, of course, this is a theoretical result, but I th what it tells us, I think, is that we can improve our understanding of a system by reducing the complexity to just a few simple statements. And each statement has the maximum, if you like, level of meaning per statement that you can achieve. So the 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 message from this part is that promises should somehow form valleys, and they should form valleys in these orthogonal directions. If we can do that, we can create a system which will simply roll into its correct state. And this is the idea behind CF Engine. That, they not, that we don't have to specify these recipes, we just specify our intentions, and the automation will make it roll into the correct state. Just to uh, convince you about this point, this is, this is my introduction to information theory that I, I give to my students, if you like. On the left-hand side, we have a high amount of information, a high amount of variability. On the right-hand side, we have low amount of information. Information is defined, you know, as, as how the amount of information you'd have to write down in order to be able to copy every single detail to some other location to make a precise copy of this. Clearly, when a very messy picture, there's more information than in a very simple picture. And you, there's, there's no accident involved 
in making logos and monuments very low information structures, very low entropy structures, things that stand out from the background, a single symbol standing out from basically a flat background. And this is how we convey meaning in society. We make low information systems so that the, the, inf the, the meaning to information content, the meaning per symbol content is very high. So what we can try to do in configuration management is the same thing. Try to make every statement in our language be, have the maximum amount of meaning attached to it. And then we'll be able to understand what it is that we're writing somehow in a clearer way because each statement will say something meaningful. So we have promises. We have IT infrastructure, which is basically pattern management. Patterns are simply variations of properties, whether it's in a garden or in an IT system, in a network, in software. It's just some variation that we have to maintain. And we know how to do this. Discrete patterns, they're the Chomsky, uh, the Chomsky grammars, regular expressions. Um, we know how to describe these things. So now the, the challenge is to put these two things together. And this is what I tried to do in CF Engine 3. So CF Engine 3 tries to be a model of promises. The syntax tries to represent promises. And we try to create a language which allows us to represent patterns of agents or patterns of components that will make these promises. The idea being to allow us to see the intention behind our configuration in the clearest possible way. A promise has three things. It has somebody making the promise or some component making a promise. It has somebody to whom the promise is made. Now in IT, that might be a documentation uh, process. Who is it that needs to know about this component, this, uh, this property, sorry? Who needs to know about this property in order for the system to work? Or maybe in order to debug it later. Who needs to be reassured about this property? or if you like, whose uncertainty needs to be reduced. That's really what we're saying. So we have a promiser, a promisee, and the body, which is simply a description of what the promise is about. And um, the other thing is that these things need to be scalable. And the autonomy principle helps us here by making every component responsible for its own promises. We avoid this arms race of um, of, um, well, we, we achieve scalability by saying that each agent will simply make its promises and as we increase the number of agents, the number of promises increases, it's flat. We don't have to be uh, forcing obligations onto these things from outside in centralized ways, creating bottlenecks uh, and needing to upgrade our servers, our centralized management points, we don't have to scale them up as the number of hosts increases because promises will scale automatically. If every, every machine is responsible for itself, we add new machines, then each machine is doing the same amount of work. It scales automatically. So here's the promise model. Um, this is just what it looks like. I'm not gonna describe it in, in great detail. It'll be another talk. At the top you see a simple promise. The file etc services promises to have permissions 644. To whom does it make this promise? Well, maybe the security staff, maybe um, an automatic monitoring system wants to know about this. Doesn't really matter. Sometimes it's not important to whom promises are made. The fact is that they are made and they influence our behavior. A promise, of course, is something to be watched and maintained verified, checked, and therefore its documentation allows us to clearly relate these checks to the in original intention. This shows the syntax that we might use in, in CF Engine 3. It has uh, a type, files. It has the object making the promise, etc services. The little arrow on the who symbol is uh, the, to whom the promise is being made. It's an optional thing. For now, we use it for documentation purposes. And then the body of the promise follows. And the body can be parameterized using reusable 
um, using reusable templates so that we can somehow create generic promises that can be reused in many different situations. Here are some other promises. And these are, in fact, patterns, you notice. They contain regular expressions. So here's an example of how we might do some kind of key management, SSH key management. Um, so all of the users under home, slash homes, dot star matches all of the users, of course, in their home directories. And we're looking for the directory dot SSH authorized keys. And we're going to do some edits in this file. We can also, once we start putting patterns in, regular expressions, start using things like uh, back references and all of the power of regular expressions, the ability to match patterns in the infrastructure and use the patterns themselves in the description of the promises. So, in other words, you know, take this garden, look at the way it is now, and make these alterations relative to what it is now, as opposed to describing it from scratch from the beginning. This can still be done in a convergent, consistent way but it somehow increases our expressibility in terms of the promises, the patterns, I'm sorry. So here's how we might use back references. Here's another promise, which is a, a search replace promise, saying any line in, in my file that starts with the hash symbol and continues in some way with anything is a, is a shell, com is a shell uh, um, comment. comment. Is a shell comment. If we wanted to convert all of our shell comments into C comments, for example, we could simply take the pattern the way that it is and rewrite it in terms of the existing pattern and promise that that will always be replaced in that way. It's a convergent, has a fixed endpoint, it's completely stable, it will converge to the same point at the end, it's predictable. We can be certain of the outcome. And the expression is, in fact, very simple. We can, of course, make other... I'm showing these examples about edit files because uh, people's favorite feature in CF Engine is editing text files, it turns out. I'm not sure that that's uh, a good thing, but, but at least this is a way of, of, make, of improving the ability to e edit text files. Finding a region in which to start and end an edit, so if you have a file containing a whole bunch of lines, you may want to restrict your edits to a particular region. You can identify the region through its patterns. How does it start? How does it end? Inside this region, we search for other patterns. So patterns within patterns. These are the grammars, the Chomsky grammars, the regular languages or uh, context-free languages. And we end up with a bunch of promises expressed in terms of CF Engine 3 language or whatever. And the, at the end of a configuration run, we can count up how many of these promises were kept, how many of them had to be repaired, or how many of them just weren't kept and, and weren't repaired. And this tells us something about the state of the system. Was it good to begin with? Did I need to fix it? If this is running continuously, how often do I need to fix it? What is it that's changing the most often? So I can now relate the changes happening on the system to my intentions for the system. Not simply that such and such a file changed on such and such a, a machine at this time or that time, but this promise was broken. This promise that has a certain meaning, which I can attach to my understanding of the system through this declarative documentation was broken, and I understand its meaning more clearly because it was based on my intentions. Well, I'm belaboring this point because I think this idea of promises is so important, and the, the understanding issue of it is important. And the thing that I focused on actually a lot in, in CF Engine 3 is connecting configuration to documentation, and really improving how to improve our understanding of the rules that we, we code. And the first thing you can do, of course, is to tie it into knowledge management. So I was mentioning to some people at lunch, knowledge management works in pretty much the same way as configuration management by promises. You can have 
a kind of semantic web of knowledge. You have a topic, an issue, and it's related to another issue in a certain way. So here's an example that I actually, this is actually made using CF Engine 3. Uh, it's a web page generated by CF Engine. And here's an association. It's saying budget is the topic of the topic du jour. And it's saying budget is an aspect of business driven IT management. So we can click on business driven IT management, and this will take us to a new page, which will take us, which will start telling us all of the information about business IT management. But if we stick on this one, you see at the top, so topic budget, says occurrences of this topic. This is a promise. It's saying that this document, which is related to here, contains information about budget. And it contains information of type management issues. These are promises. So documentation can also be understood using this idea of promises. And so it's natural to try to bring together the idea of documentation with the idea of the configuration requisites for the system and say, I can understand more clearly this configuration by relating it to this documentation. And even the documentation itself can have other topics which are related, which will allow me to understand it even better or find out more or read more or be inspired more about this subject. So this associativity that is in promises is also extremely useful for understanding. Here is uh, the project for next year, which I've set myself for um, me and my team. How to create a smart monitoring system, actually, based on promises. We've already said that promises have to be verified. They have to be watched over, monitored, checked. So why not tie in monitoring to knowledge management? Why not have a web page about something like the Apache uh, web service, for example, which points to a bunch of machines running the service? So here we have an association Apache web server is running on. And then here, here come all the machines that it's running on. This comes out of CF Engine or something. You can detect this. Apache HTTPD is configured by, and then here's a bunch of things that tell us about the things we need to configure in order to make this work. When we click on those, we get to the documentation for those things, or maybe we get to the actual promises that have been made about those things. Apache HTTPD depends on OpenSSL. So now we know we have to check that OpenSSL open is also configured to make this work. And again, this this associativity, this ability to connect things together, and the idea of a promise as simply representing this relationship very clearly and simply, would allow us to unify all of these different aspects of configuration management from describing the patterns to the actual properties that they represent to this, uh, this nice way of using it as an engineering tool for breaking the problem down into its component atoms and figuring out how to combine them again into new, new things. We can use the associativity of the documentation to inspire us to new ways of putting it together, or simply to debug existing uh, constellations of these promises. Tie it into our monitoring system, uh, and just bring all of these aspects together and give people an unprecedented, an unprecedented level of understanding of the system The final thing that I want to uh, do with these promises, which we haven't done at all yet, is to understand how to do process management based on them. Everything I've talked about is about state. Not sequences, but these, these states that we want to be in. It's somehow a very static picture of, of a system. We want it to be in this particular condition. It might be doing stuff dynamically, but it's the environment as a whole, the patterns are static. But what if we want to do something like add employee to the database or add new employee to, to Google? How would we do that? Well, we first have to register his details, which is a human issue, an interactive typing issue. Then there's the creation of the account, which is automatable. Then there's the creation of the home directories, the allocation of resources, 
uh, generation of secret keys, all of these things need to happen in a certain sequence. And each of these things has to be tied into some kind of um, cooperative, uh, um, call it choreography, if you like. How can we do this in a way that uses promises and therefore retains these important aspects of promises, the clarity, the pattern matching, and so on? Is that a possible thing to do? And we were talking at lunch about this idea of packages um, for encapsulating promises. In CF Engine 3, we have the idea of bundles, which is something like modules or packages of related issues. Uh, my friend Oliver Couch at Tufts calls these things aspects. And these are simply ways of encapsulating uh, related issues, which can then be put into processes in CF Engine 3. We can do this already. But I think there's still a lot of work to be done about understanding how business processes are modeled by these bundles of promises. And it's quite an interesting uh, idea to, to be able to add the human roles into the story as well, not just the automation system, but how we you know, respond to whether the user has typed in his data or not yet, or answered an email, or if an SMS gets passed between people in an organization, can we tie that into the process as well, but still have these nice, these nice uh, decision well properties that have stable outcomes, predictable outcomes. This is a, a thing for future work. Well, I talk about promises, and since I started this, you wouldn't believe the number of puns and jokes people can make about promises. Hence my slide. Promises are very promising, and that's a promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not to belabor the word, I think this concept of a promise is extremely useful. It goes far beyond, and of course promises are everywhere in, in society. We couldn't, almost couldn't have society without promises. And they go to improving our trust and improving our confidence in the, that things will turn out in the way that they want, we want them to be. This business of voluntary cooperation is so important. It's not just a philosophy, it's an engineering discipline. I think this is crucial. I'm not just harping on about promises because I have certain uh, politics or a certain philosophy for, for life, although these things also have their merits. But I'm doing it because this idea of chemistry, this atomic view of systems, building systems up from component parts and putting them back together again, is a basic engineering discipline which we lack in the understanding of IT management. Thinking of Toffler from the beginning, how do we manage variations? Diversity is cheap and requires no a priori surrender of autonomy of systems. We don't have to force uh, views onto systems. We can get them to cooperate voluntarily even if it, that means that they voluntarily choose to follow some leader and centralize themselves again, it's okay. That's one possible configuration, but not the only one. We can do this as long as the promises are independent, the agents are autonomous, and we can do it in such a way that this process documents itself through the promises that it makes and that the intentions are extremely clear. The coding is even in some sense optimal in the sense in the Shannon information theoretic sense because each symbol will appear once and only once. Now, I'm completely aware that the lobby for traditional push-based push steamroll rollout configuration is extremely powerful and strong, but I'm convinced that they shouldn't detract from this development in a finer grained control over system. Uh, predictability that is based more on realism than on wishful thinking and will allow us to develop an engineering methodology for system chemistry. So I've been writing CF Engine 3 for the past year in order to have a framework for just realizing this and although I would say there are plenty more years to go I think from the position I've got to so far it's now looking extremely possible to realize this manifesto. And with that, I would thank you for your attention and say um, 
look forward to CF Engine 3. It's kind of exciting. Thank you very much. I would be happy to answer uh, any questions if, uh, yes, sir. Um, so things have seemed very abstract, and I'm wondering if you have them. Things have seemed very abstract, and I'm wondering if you have more uh, concrete examples of the problems that come up and how uh, your uh, promise-based uh, system uh, can solve them. Like, for example, you're uh, setting up DNS. You said, okay, uh, you know, there are promises that could be made, and uh, these require other systems to make other promises, like uh, that um, my port 51 uh, will be reachable if I open it, and that kind of thing. But you know, it's th th there was very little detail, and there's you know very little of those concrete that Roy really would show to me the, uh, the the kinds of problems that could be solved and what the solutions would look like. Of course, when you get down to individual the individual promises, you you get down to technical technical levels of detail. And it's quite possible, it's, it's, it's easy to make these kinds of promises. I'm not quite sure what kind of answer that you want. Uh, clearly, we can make a promise to test whether, a promise to observe whether a certain port is up and running. And if that promise has been, if, if that is verified, we can make the other promise to, to use that uh, port for queries. So for just for example, the, the DNS uh, file itself, uh, resolve conf file, contains a number of promises. I promise to search this, dom this domain using these name servers, uh, one after the other. And if I don't get an answer from this one, I promise to use the next one, and so on. This can be understood as a number of promises. But I can make promises on top of that, which, of course, uh, ensure that this file contains these lines so that, they, so that the resolver will always behave in this way. And what I have to do is basically uh, I'm starting out with an environment in which the technology behaves in a particular way. And what I'm trying to do in configuration management is to make sure that the conditions are correct for, for this to behave, to work together with other components. So we simply have to put together a, let's see, here we are. Where was this file? Well, something like, uh, a file looking something like this would contain a number of these issues. And there would be perhaps a promise for etc resolve conf. There would be a, perhaps a promise to restart the bind service once this thing was edited, if necessary. There would be a promise on another machine correlated with this one, which allows it to test whether this thing is up and running and adapt its behavior in this case. Um, I don't think that's very abstract. It's actually very concrete. It's a, it's a particular thing that you would write in a configuration file, and it would be acted upon. But Perhaps I'm not answering the question in the way that you wanted. Well, um, what, what's the added power besides just calling everything a promise? I'm like, you could call an imperative program. Oh, I promise to execute this little code line, and then this code line, then this code line. And you could call a declarative file. Yeah. Oh, I promise to make all these declarations true. Um, but you know, that's just wrapping uh, a, uh, a paper called promise around something that's old. Like what, yeah. What's the newness? No, I mean, you're absolutely right. Of course, the term promise is, well, the term promise, of course, is not new because they're everywhere in society. The, the thing I think that's useful about the promise is that it documents an intention. And we, we take away the focus on this uh, imperative detail. And I, I repeat this word again and again because people need to hammer home this idea that what's important is the intention and not the detail itself. Technicians always love the details, but in fact, these details may even be wrong. They may be inappropriate. And if you repeat them time and time again, they may, in fact, break the system. You know, in a typical programming language, if you repeat a program twice, it may bring you to the correct state the first time. Then you repeat it the second time, it actually breaks the system. This doesn't happen in this model of promises. No matter how many times you repeat the system, these promises are kept in the sense of their, their original meaning. In other words, they bring you to this very predictable location. And that's, that's the technical difference between just calling an, an imperative thing promises and actually having this uh, 
actually having a property which is different. But then what I'm saying at the end with this process management is then how do you add that back? So how do you, how do you build on this language of very predictable atomic changes and then try to reproduce something imperative like a business process or a thing with many steps to it and, and keep that predictability of each step in a way which, again, a traditional lang programming language can't do because it's dependent on its initial state. This is not dependent on the initial state. It's depend it, it specifies the final state. And I think that's the key difference. Does that make sense? Thanks. Do we have uh, questions from the larger world? Yes. Have you found that in larger systems, you may end up with circular uh, dependencies, right? Sorry. Dependent promises. Um, circular or deadlocking uh, promises that end up with basically creating a local minimum or ring of minimums that prevent you from getting to your, to your desired final state? That is, uh, <laughs> that's a good question. And there are several different answers to it. One is yes, of course, you can create a contradiction. A simple contradiction you might assume is an error. Uh, you know, set, set the permissions on file to X, set the permissions on file to Y, simply an error. And it's easily detectable in this model because the, the intention is clearly expressed. It's trivial to check. But then you have the situation in what, what if, you know, I promise to have these permissions first and then I want to change to these permissions and then I want to change them back again. Maybe that's the behavior that you want to promise so that, in fact, your, your ring cycle is in fact what you want. You know, maybe you want to open a window for transferring some files at a particular time of day, and then you want to close the security hole afterwards. Whatever the reasons for it, you could do that, and it wouldn't be wrong. It would simply be an intention. So I think the difficulty with, with contradictions is in understanding what is in fact the intention behind them. Do we mean to have this first do this, then do that in order? Or if these things are somehow parallel, then it seems clearer that they're simply a contradiction. If they're supposed to be true at the same time, then it's clear that they're a contradiction. So then those things are easy to detect. Um, so yes, they can occur. And yes, they can be detected. And they can even be uh, resolved automatically in some sense. What I would worry about more is in uh, larger systems, where these rings are not at you know file permission levels, but you have some symbol that represents some aggregation of a very large farm of symbols below them that inadvertently depend on each other or conflict with each other, and then you need to figure out if that's actually what you want or if that's a mistake. Right. Oh, I, I understand. Uh, this actually can't happen in the low-level language because precisely because of this orthogonality idea. Uh, all of these different promises somehow flow through each other or are parallelizable in, in a sense, so that that would never happen. But as you start building sequence on top of it, uh, then these things can start to happen. And that is somehow, uh, a, you introduce those dependencies manually into the language. And what's nice about the promise model is that it forces you to document that explicitly because the basic language is is immune to that problem. Anything that you introduce will be introduced manually and you'll therefore be able to see it clearly. Again, it goes to this sort of engineering idea of, the, of this as a, a, a methodology. By forcing you to make all of these things very, very explicit, it's forcing you to confront all of these issues as well. And therefore, it, it makes it more likely, perhaps, that you would find them. That's the idea anyway. Thank you. Thank you.